Um, you know, before the era of targeted therapy, before we had all these new drugs that uh, now, uh, what was the standard of care? Was was docetaxel if after radioactive? Yeah, it was so so um, actually, it wasn't docetaxel. It was actually adriamycin right. was the only approved drug in 1974. And even though it was FDA approved, it became clear that. Once we had CAT scans, it turned out they weren't responding. Right. So we actually had an FDA-approved drug that was not causing responses. So mm -hmm. it was it was actually supportive care. Supportive so this care. is really an amazing. I mean, in our generation, to be yeah. dealing in a, in a, with a therapy that had no. Not, I mean, yeah. there's a few examples of this, but more and more they're they're just vanishingly few where there was nothing, right. and now all of a sudden right. this is an agent. And and when you look at comparison to like lenvatinib, sutent compared, let's say you know. Uh, with uh, lertrectinib, I mean, side effect wise, profile wise, um, uh, you know, well, how do you how do yeah. you see that in comparison? So, as you know, lertrectinib is very well tolerated. Mm -hmm. With dizziness as being one of the primary um, uh, issues, and we do actually have patients that get that myalgia, and it's mm -hmm. not just if they don't take their drug on time. Unfortunately, it's sort of anticipatory, so mm -hmm. we're going to have to, I think, work that out. Although I think that can be worked out by dosing, so we're going to probably learn how to ad adjust sure. for that. But in general, larotrectinib is very, very well tolerated. And even the dizziness in our patients, even though it didn't go away, um, some people say it gets better with yeah. longer treatment, but in the patients where it didn't, one single dose reduction and they still have a complete response. response. Yeah. So it may not be that we need to have dizziness, like we can probably treat around that. Yeah. The other drugs can cause quite a bit of morbidity, whether it's hand foot skin reaction, with lenvatinib, there's a lot of hypertension. That's actually the number one issue we have to manage. And that's not just uh, grade one, that's great, a significant proportion of grade three. Yeah. Um, so with hand foot skin reaction, with serafinib, and, and um, hypertension, and then in both cases, um, diarrhea, mm. these impact people. And so they were thrilled to have, uh, initially, we're thrilled, of course, to have drugs that are so effective. Yeah. Um, but I think toxicity profile does matter, especially because these patients live a long time now with their disease. So Marsha, you know, you've now treated, you know, probably uh, many, many patients now with uh, uh, N-track fusions and thyroid. When you look at the data sets and so forth and your own experience, what, what is the overall response in, in thyroid, in papillary, in some patients, you know, ab even anaplastic thyroid, right? Right. Yeah. So there actually haven't been that many. There's only yeah. been about seven patients. One of them was anaplastic. Um, and they did very well compared to anaplastic. So their progression-free survival, I think, they, they lasted on the drug about six months before they had some progression. Um, of course, that's a BRAF um, wild-type patient who then got tested. That six months in anaplastic, anybody who treats anaplastic thyroid cancer, it turns out to be a good number because mm -hmm. these patients on the other kinase inhibitors would progress by the first assessment. Mm -hmm. So it's probably active in anaplastic. I definitely would be testing every patient who has anaplastic thyroid mm -hmm. cancer without a BRAF mm -hmm. mutation. Um, interestingly, in the differentiated, there have been about five or six, and the responses have been great. Mm -hmm. Just like you've seen across the board, we're talking mm -hmm. um, a very high you know, 60 70% rate, mm -hmm. and we're talking deep responses. We're talking 80%. Um, I think you, you point out was one of the mm -hmm. ones on the phase one, a complete mm -hmm. response. Mm -hmm. These are really amazing. And the one thing I actually would like to point out about thyroid cancer, we have a new adolescent uh, thyroid cancer program. Yeah. And it turns out that there are um, a, a growing number of, well, not a growing number, we're just more aware of them now, of adolescents who have RAI refractory uh, thyroid cancer. And almost all of those patients have ETV6 and, and TRAC3. Yeah. So I think that we don't have a lot of experience with them. I have three or four patients in my clinic who don't need systemic therapy yet, but as soon as it starts to grow, mm. um, this will be a great drug for them because they'll be able to go to school, have a great quality of life. And I might really go to this before, larotrectinib before going to the other FDA approved drugs, just because side effect profiles in kids is really gonna make a difference. Yeah. Patients who've had lenvatinib yeah. um, have done well. So it's not that we don't use them, but I think side effect profiles do count. And it's right. an interesting cadre of patients that I yeah. think has been under, yeah. um, under um, uh, discussed, or, and we'll be having more data on that soon. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Bros and Dr. Lanier for this insightful discussion. And thank you to our audience for watching this targeted oncology presentation on precision medicine.